The Quran gets owned. This is my latest series to this channel where I will debunk some of the most popular so-called scientific miracles. Hmm, that's actually an oxymoron now that I think about it in the Quran. Okay, so we all know that the Muslims are very fond of claiming that the Quran accurately describes human embryonic development and hence constitutes a scientific miracle in the Quran. Here are the verses that they primarily use to substantiate this claim. Okay, first we have 2313, which states then we placed him as a drop in a place of rest, 2314, which they break up, um, which states then we made the drop into a leech-like structure, then we made out of the chewed lump and bones and clove the bones and flesh, then we developed out of it another creature, and he gave you hearing and sight and feeling and understanding. Then we have 32.9, which states, Then out of a piece of chewed flesh, partially formed and partially unformed, and we caused whom we will to rest in the wombs for an appointed term. Then 39.6, which states, He makes you in the wombs of your mothers in stages, one after another, in three veils of darkness. You know, whenever someone criticizes Islam, one of the most common arguments that is made is, Oh, you're taking it out of context. Yet, context seems to go out the window when talking about miracles. For example, in 2313 is a common verse to use, but what they fail to quote is a verse right before it, which is 2312, which states, Barely we have created man from a product of wet earth. Now, anyone with even a marginal understanding of embryology or science should know that this is wrong. There's absolutely no stage in which the embryo is a product of wet earth. They also conveniently left out 86, 5 through 7, which states, Now, let man but think from where he is created. He is created from a drop emitted proceeding from between the backbone and the ribs. Now, hopefully everyone knows that semen does not come from between the backbone and the ribs, but from your testes. Now, the most common Muslim defense to this is... You don't know Arabic! You don't know Arabic! You don't know Arabic! What that actually meant was the blood that makes the semen comes from the ribs. But this can easily be debunked if we look at the tafsirs. In case you don't know what tafsirs are, they are interpretation of what the verse actually meant, written by Muslim scholars who live closer to the time of Muhammad. They base their interpretations on the sayings of Muhammad, his family, and friends, and as educated scholars, their command of the Arabic language was exquisite. In other words, these people actually knew what they were talking about. Anyway, if we look at Tafsir bin Kathir, it says he was created from a water gushing forth, meaning the sexual fluid that comes out bursting from the man and the woman. Thus, the child is produced from both of them by permission of Allah. In other words, nut, not blood. So from these two verses alone, we already know that the Quran is off to a pretty poor start, but let's ignore these two verses and go on to the verses that Muslims love to quote when talking about embryonic development. 23.13 This is actually rather easy to debunk. The Muslims claiming that this verse is miraculous often translated as, Then we placed him as a drop in a place of rest which assumingly means the embryo is resting in, resting in the womb. Oh, well that sounds right. However, if we look at those good old tafsirs again, we see a different story. Let's go to Tafsir al Jalilin, which tells us that the verse actually meant that we made him, namely man, the progeny of Adam, a drop, a sperm drop, and a secure lodging, which is the womb. Hmm. I'm not aware of any period in which the embryo is a drop of semen sitting in the uterus. But then again, I'm not well versed in Arabic or embryology, so maybe I'm wrong. Next verse. 
2314. The ones propagating this idea of the Quran containing modern embryology like to translate it as, then we made the drop into a leech-like structure, then we made out of the chewed lump bones and clove the bones with flesh, then we developed it out another creature. And he gave you the hearing and the sight and the understanding. Okay, first of all, we don't even need to go into the tafsirs to know why this is wrong. We know that the bones are not there at all when the muscles and skin begin to form. If anything, it's more of a simultaneous occurrence rather than consecutive. There's never, ever, ever a stage where there's a skeleton and it gets clothed with flesh. And we also know that Galen, who was a Greek doctor that lived around 500 years before Muhammad, made the exact same mistake. Now, many of you may be saying, well, how did Muhammad get this Greek knowledge? I'll give you a name. Harith bin Khalada. He was close to the Muhammad. He was even the one who designated Abu Bakr's uh, illness due to, uh, due to poisoning. He received his medical training in the Sassanid Empire, and as we all know, the Sassanids were well-versed in Greco-Roman medicine. Okay, next verse, 32.9. Then out of a piece of chewed flesh, partially formed and partially unformed, and we cause whom we will to rest in the wounds for an appointed term. Okay, yeah, if I need to explain to you why this isn't a miracle, then I've got nothing for you. Next verse. The final verse often touted to prove the miraculous nature of chronic embryonic development is 39.6. He makes you in the wombs of your mothers in stages, one after another, in three veils of darkness. Okay, the idea of embryonic development occurring in stages is nothing new. And for those of you who have been, who have been keeping up, you should already know where he got this from. The Greeks. Hippocrates and Galen both describe embryonic development as occurring in stages. Well, that's enough ownage for one day. Stay tuned for more debunking of so-called scientific miracles in the Quran in my series, The Quran Gets Owned. But wait, one more thing. What about Keith Moore? Many Muslims, when propagating the embryology of the Quran, quote Keith Moore as a leading Canadian scientist who made this statement. It has been a great pleasure for me to help clarify statements in the Quran about human development. It is clear to me that these statements must have come to Muhammad from God or Allah because almost all of this knowledge was not discovered, uh, discovered until many centuries later. This proves to me that Muhammad must have been a messenger of God or Allah. They are very fond of using this quote over and over. Besides this being an argumentum ad veracundium, logical fallacy, there are several concerns that I would like to point out. First of all, we know that Mr. Moore was flown free of charge first class to Saudi Arabia where he then stayed in the finest hotels prior to making this statement. Second, didn't that statement seem to be prepared by someone else? I mean, it's just my speculation. And third, if he really believed what he was saying, then why hasn't he taken Shahada? If he did, where's the footage of it? Certainly a leading scientist taking Shahada due to miracles in the Quran would have been videotaped. Where are the two witnesses required by Islamic ritual if he took Shahada? It all seems a bit fishy to me, if you know what I mean.